Hello everyone, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will be your driver on this journey. Uh, today, I am going over a topic that may shock longtime viewers. It may uh, surprise longtime viewers. It may even horrify longtime viewers. I think I messed up that quote, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the Nimzo Indian uh, with the white pieces, and I'm not going to play F3 on move four. I know this is, this is terrifying stuff, but let's, let's take a look at why you might want to do this. So. The reason I first started looking at the A3 Nimzo Indian, also known as the Samish, one of the many openings that uh, bears uh, Samish's name, um, the reason I started looking at this is because I had to play in this tournament called the Master Lab in St. Louis. I went over some of those games over the past couple lectures. Um, but in the Master Lab, of course, is National Master Julian Perleko, uh, one of my good friends who knows basically my entire repertoire. He knows that I play the F3 Nimzo, he knows what lines I play in the F3 Nimzo. I'm a very predictable person when it comes to, to a repertoire. So uh, I wasn't totally sure what I wanted to do against him because I figured he was gonna have something prepped, something uh, to try to surprise me, uh, unless I wanted to surprise him first. So of course, that's how I arrived at the move A3 on move four. So let's go ahead and put this on the board. Of course, we start in the Nimzo Indian, which is uh, considered by many to be black's best response to d4, assuming white allows it by playing this knight to c3. Uh, and it's the Nimzo after bishop to b4, uh, directly pinning this knight. Um, and then, you know, the game can go in any number of directions. So, of course, I am one of the leading proponents of the f3 Nimzo. I, I cheer whenever this move gets played. I think it's a great opening, uh, a great way to especially get good positions uh, against players who aren't quite as solid against it as, as they should be. Um, I don't want to call it a surprise weapon, because I play it as my, my main opening, but it can definitely be more unusual for players with the black pieces to deal with. They, they're probably not facing f3 nearly as often as they're facing e3 or queen c2, uh, or even these other sidelines like knight f3, where white just tries to develop. Uh, so f3, I think, is a very good try uh, for white in this opening, and I do think that the lines sort of hold up. Now, that being said, if black has all the time in the world to prepare for you, uh, there are a number of very tricky options that, that black can go for against the f3 Nimzo. Uh, and in particular, I was sort of concerned about this move c5, when after d5, the lines are going to get very, very concrete. And uh, sometimes it, it turns into this uh, sort of thing where whoever knows more is going to get the, the better position and, and might be doing very, very well. Um, and of course, if black plays well, then black is going to be fine uh, against the f3 and so. But that's sort of almost any opening in chess. So I wasn't sure what to do. Uh, so what did, what did I do? I turned to our grandmaster in residence at the time, Josh Fidel, for some wisdom. Um, and I think this is something that you guys can, can sort of take home as well. What do you do against somebody who knows your entire repertoire, knows uh, which lines you like, which lines you play? Well, you play something that's almost your repertoire. <laughs> um, you know that they've prepared for you, prepared for the exact lines that you play. Uh, so if you can instead deviate a little early and get into positions that are similar, uh, then you're going to have the upper hands uh, because you're going to know uh, the type of position better than they do, and they're not going to have all this theory mapped out. So what's like the F3 Nimzo, but isn't the F3 Nimzo? Of course, it's the A3 Nimzo. So let's. First of all, we'll look at a position in the F3 Nimzo and see how it's kind of similar. So against F3, my favorite line to play against is D5. When we're going to go A3, takes, takes, uh, let's just say castles, takes, takes, E3. And now we want to go bishop D3, knight E2, and play for E4. This is uh, the plan that I've shown a number of times uh, uh, in this class. So with the A3 Nimzo, um, White is going to try to, to do something pretty similar. So uh, a3 and move 4. Black should probably take this knight. I think this is the only move that gets played. Uh, and then let's say black uh, sort of naively just plays something like d5. Then we transpose into the f3 Nimzo lines that I like, just very directly. We're already there. Um, and if black does something like castles, then white's going to try to do something very similar. We might start with e3 this time, but we want to go bishop d3. Uh, f3, e4, and, and try to, to get these pawns uh, in the center rolling. So very similar to the f3 Nimzo, but it's going to avoid all of you know, these lines and lines of theory that I'm sure Julian had, uh, had prepared for me. 
So before I jump into my game against Julian, I want to show you the prep work that I did uh, to get ready for the game. And then I thought it might be fun to uh, go through my game with Julian together and see if my, my prep pays off, see if we can punish Julian in, in the opening. So the first one I want to look at is a very recent game between uh, Pragnananda, the Indian prodigy, and Andrei Esipenko, the Russian prodigy. Uh, so Battle of the Prodigies, this happened at the Tata Steel Masters Tournament earlier this year. Um, and Prague chose this move A3. Uh, Esipenko, of course, takes on C3. Uh, we get now C5 for black. And this is really, uh, this game shows pretty much one of the only two main plans that I, I've seen from black at, at the top level, which is what makes the A3 Nimzo a really great surprise weapon. You know, if black only has a couple ways uh, that they normally play, it doesn't take a ton of work to actually feel confident playing it over the board. So Esipenko starts with C5. We, now we're going to see e3 by white. I really like e3 better than f3 in these positions uh, because a lot of the time we can just play e4 without ever playing f3, and then we might want to play f2, f4 in one go. So e3 tries to save us some time over normal f3 lines. So e3, we get now knight c6, and black is going to play with some plans that, that do occur in the f3 nimzo sometimes. So uh, who can come up with an idea or two for, for black here? There's really only two things that, that black normally tries to do in these positions. Um, I'll put one move on the board for white so you can just see. And now let's say black's turn here. How are we going to organize our pieces? Yeah, what do you think, Brian? Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's going to be one of the main plans uh, in, in these positions, is something like knight a5, b6, bishop a6. And you'll start to see the pieces start to gang up on the c4 pawn, a very common source of counterplay for black. Um, black does give up the bishop pair early in the opening. And so black does normally try to prove that these two pawns are, in fact, a weakness, not just a strength, strengthening the d4 pawn in the center. And knight a5 and bishop a6 are a very common way to do that. Uh, however, this is not going to be the main idea in this game. That's going to be the main idea in the next game that we look at. So in this game, uh, this is the more sort of forcing variation that, that black goes for. That's going to clarify the, the situation in the center a little bit more quickly. So here, black goes ahead and castles. Uh, white plays knight to e2. Again, we want to leave our f pawn a little bit more mobile. We want to play f4 sometimes. Um, Actually, most of the time we want to play f4. It's kind of our main idea. And the knight on e2 is needed to support the d-pawn uh, before we can play something like e4. Right? This is just attack twice. So knight e2, good move. Uh, b6 now for black, follows the, the normal, normal ideas. And e4 for white. No reason to wait on this move. It's, it's just a good move to play. Um, now black is going to play a slightly unusual looking move. But if you're familiar with these positions, it, it might not surprise you so much. So white is actually making uh, a pretty nasty threat here. So let's say black continues with something like bishop to a6. Uh, what do you think white might have in mind in, in this position? Uh, yeah, queen c2. So you're trying to prepare e5 with the threat to the h7 pawn, right? Um, so I think queen c2 would actually let black off the hook just a little bit. There's, um, there's a way for black to just um, kind of negate that threat. Uh, basically, the move that black should have played last turn, black could play in response to queen c2. So I don't want to give it away just yet. Yeah, Brian? Yeah, so f4, f5, but um, this is white's normal kind of active, active plan. Um, but uh, against white's most active plan, oftentimes black should just kind of, I think, attack c4. So bishop a6 would be, be helping black. The, the move I'm looking at uh, is actually this move bishop to g5. Um, this is going to give black uh, some pretty uncomfortable uh, problems to deal with, actually. This, this pin is not so comfortable. And you're not exactly happy with playing something like queen c7. And uh, 
yeah, I'm not even sure if, if I want to do this. I think I can even just play e5, and I'm winning material very directly. Um, like if this knight moves now, then there's bishop e7. Uh, and that's how I, I was uh, claiming I was going to win some materials. So like even like f4. And the point now is you can't really play this move as long as this is happening. And, and white's just expanding through in the center very quickly. So um, maybe your idea of f4, f5 is, is also going to be quite useful here for white. Uh, because black's best move in this position is knight e8, I think. So kind of unusual looking, retreating the knight all the way back. But it, it does stop this idea of bishop g5, and it also gives black an extra option against this idea of, of f4. So in the game, Prague continues with castles, and then we do see bishop to a6. And then as Brian pointed out, f4, f5 is one of our main ideas. And so that's what uh, Prague uh, starts to go for here. So I sort of listed this as one of the more forcing variations because here uh, black needs to sort of deal with, with our threats. If black tries something like knight to a5, I think they are very seriously going to start to get into trouble after this move f5. White, I, I think, tends to get a little bit of an advantage um, in, in these positions. Like you can still play f6, keep the pawns at bay a little bit, but these bishops are going to open up. And the queen is going to have an easy access to the king's side. And white's just going to start launching an attack. So not the most comfortable uh, for, uh, for black at all. And let me just uh, show uh, how an example game went. OK, this was not a good example game. Let me show how this example game went. Um, here, black tried king h8 uh, for some reason, stepping out of some checks. White expands with e5. Black does get to capture this pawn. But you can just already see, like after f6, takes takes. Um, <laughs> Rook takes f6 is already a nice sacrifice. And the pieces just sort of come into the position. I'm not saying this was the most uh, perfectly played game. But you see white is, is just sort of rolling on the king's side. Meanwhile, these extra pawns on the queen's side are, are less than convincing, uh, in particular with this knight on a5, a little bit out of play. So outside of that, uh, what can black do? Right. What is what is black going to do if not knight a5 and attack the c4 pawn? How can what uh, black try to prevent f4 f5? Yeah, Brian. So I, I think the point behind knight e8 is so that black can play with f5 now. That that as well. Um, that is the point in, in this position. So you, you want to go f5. You want to stop white from playing f5. And now white has to uh, be a little bit careful, or else he's going to end up uh, kind of significantly worse. Right? You might be tempted to play something like e5 here. Right? You just want to keep all your pawns together in the center, keep this massive center uh, together. But I do think black is the one that, that ends up on the better side of things now after knight to a5. Right? It looks like you have all this nice space in the center. But in reality, uh, black has done a good job of keeping things closed on the king's side. Right? Our, our powerful bishops are, are not actually looking great stuck behind all these pawns. Uh, and so now this, this play on the queen's side is, in fact, going to be very relevant. You know, rook c8 uh, to come, takes on, c, takes on d4, takes on c4. The rook's going to start to uh, invade over here. And I think black is, is going to be pretty significantly better after something like e5. So instead of that, what white can do is actually take on f5 and somewhat surprisingly take on c5. So why take on c5 here? Like how does, how does this move make sense? We're giving up our central pawn for actually the, the b pawn when you really think about it. So why d takes c? What's, what's the point? OK, that's actually going to be a very important uh, tactical resource in, in a couple moves here. So yeah, queen d5, actually very relevant to the position. But kind of more importantly, um, it's going to allow white to, to hold on to these queen side pawns. Uh, if we play something like uh, knight g3, for example, let's say black takes some time to play g6 just to defend uh, rook e1. OK, well, yeah, let's say. Uh, black defends. You, you do actually have to defend your, your d pawn. It's attacked twice. And then, uh, for example, knight to a5. We have to defend here. And already, takes takes and rook c8. And this open c file is, is going to be very much uh, to black's advantage in this position. Also, okay. ideas of playing d5 and taking uh, advantage of, of this, this diagonal, opening up this file 
activating the black pieces. So D takes C, for one, uh, removes uh, this idea for black of opening up the C file. And number two, as you said, queen d5 is going to be relevant. It's also going to be relevant that this d pawn is backwards on, on a half open file. So d takes c is the second clarification in the structure. Uh, of course, we started with e takes f, e takes f, now d takes c, b takes c. Uh, and now we are sort of nearing the, the end of the opening. Um, knight g, or bishop e3, is how white chooses to start making a threat. So black plays d6. Now knight g3 makes another threat. So black plays, um, oh, didn't mean to do that. All right, we'll get back there. We'll get back there. Uh, in this game, Essipenko plays knight to e7, which is very much not the main move. So uh, after knight g3, here the best move for black I, I do think is g6. Uh, and then there is sort of a, a fake tactic. And by that, I mean it's, it's a real tactic. The tactic works, but it's just not very good for white. So can you find the fake tactic here? By fake tactic, I mean real tactic. Yeah, it's uh, almost. So it involves your idea from earlier, right? Queen d5 check is actually a threat now, if we can make it work. Get rid of those arrows. So not knight takes f5, but bishop takes f5. Yeah, that's right. So bishop f5 here. And if you look in the database, I think this is the most played move uh, by far. It's played 18 out of uh, the 30 games in the quote unquote, master's database on, on lead chess. Now, this is just a very bad move. <laughs> Black takes back with the pawn. We go queen d5 check, uh, rook f7. Queen takes d6. Uh, but now after bishop to b7, this is why Black played rook f7. Uh, queen to a4. It turns out Black is just doing very well here after, after something like h5. Uh, now, why is Black doing well? Technically, white is up a pawn, but this bishop is sort of a monster, unopposed. This is why we're playing h5. We want to go h4, put our pieces on the g file, and, and white's going to be under a lot of pressure here. Uh, this knight doesn't look great on e8, but it will look great on e4. And yeah, <laughs> white's just not doing well. Uh, your counterpart to this bishop on b7 is this bishop on e3, which is you know pro problematic, problematic to say the least. So bishop takes f5, just not a good move, uh, not a good move. Uh, instead, uh, just to show you how your normal games might go, um, white needs to do some work to make these two pieces make sense, basically. Uh, once these two pieces make sense for white, then the position is going to be sort of settled, and I'm confident that uh, I, I can play this opening, this opening line without any issues. Uh, and that's something to, to take away when you're trying to prep something. If you get to like move 17, and you're like, all right, this is it. I've looked at like 17 moves. I don't want to look any, anywhere else. You have to at least know what your plan is for your pieces. Because right now, this knight and bishop just don't make any sense. Uh, so that being said, what is the plan for the pieces? Well, generally, and we'll see this in the game, you want to go rook e1 to start. Uh, and then after something like knight f6, bringing the, the pieces back in, you actually want to go bishop f2. And the point now is we are actually bringing this knight to the very, very natural e3 square, where it's going to defend the weakness on c4. It's going to threaten to jump into d5. Uh, and just be, be an active piece. Uh, the plan for this bishop as well, uh, this diagonal is no good, this diagonal is no good, this diagonal, none of these diagonals are good over here, but we do have one active diagonal left. Uh, the bishop is going to be useful on h4. It's going to help us try to invade on the e7 square uh, a lot of the time. So just to show a few moves, queen d7, for example, knight f1, knight e3, bishop h4. Um, and here I would, I would stop looking looking at, at opening theory, to be honest. You don't need to really go much deeper than this. You just need to know, why are my pieces on these squares? What am I doing with them? And, and how can I continue? For example, put the rooks on the open files, look at knight d5 ideas, and uh, that, that's really all, all you need here. Put the rooks on the files, 
White's going to try to maybe invade on the queen side, maybe invade on the e file. And black is, of course, also going to be trying, trying to activate. Uh, so that's how it normally goes with g6. But in this game, of course, uh, SC Penko deviates with knight to e7. Uh, and already, I think white is going to be a little bit better here. Uh, this knight just doesn't really belong on the e7 square. Black needs to be able to contest the e file a lot of the time. And remember where our bishop is heading. If it's heading to h4, then it might actually be giving this knight some problems on, on e7. So uh, Prague chooses queen to f3, which is a little bit weird in this case, but it's a fine move. Uh, knight to c7 now, uh, another sort of deviation from the norm. Again, this knight normally comes to f6 to look at squares like, like knight e4. Uh, but of course, it can't do that here because we have not played g6 and our pawn would be hanging. So knight c7 instead. Now rook a to b1, uh, another perfectly fine move. Put the rook on the file. Uh, queen to d7. Now Prague does go for the normal repositioning. Rook fe1, bishop f2, knight e1, or knight f1, knight e3, and bishop h4. So it's that simple, right? Uh, SC Penko deviated from the theory. Uh, Prague, I think, took quite a bit of time in the tournament. Uh, but he comes up with the same ideas that we've seen before. And, and that's what it really means to be prepared in an opening. You know the common maneuvering ideas. In this case, rook e1, knight f1, bishop f2. Knight e3 and bishop h4. Uh, and from here, SC Penko actually pretty quickly collapses. Uh, the way that he's organized his pieces is not so good. You know, maybe he knew all the theory at some point, but he clearly didn't really remember uh, how he was supposed to position his pieces here. Uh, in the game, he tried queen to g7, hitting this pawn. Prague just simply plays rook b to c1. And now after rook to e6, I believe uh, white is already pretty significantly better. Um, so see if you can find a nice idea for, for Prague to kind of further weaken the, the black pieces. Black has a nice, or sorry, white has a nice, uh, nice little concept here. So keeping in mind, one of our big ideas, kind of invade down the B file, invade on the queen side. Uh, of course, we're sort of annoyed that all these pieces are, are attacking C4. And so there's one piece for black that's sort of doing a great job of uh, hampering us when, when you look at those two ideas specifically. So what, what piece of black's is, is doing the best at that? Stopping us from invading on the queen side, attacking our c4 pawn. Yeah, the, the knight on b6. And as always, when there's a knight on b6, I know you guys have seen this idea before. Uh, how can we harass a knight on b6? Or a knight on b3, or even a knight on g3, or g6? These knights on these four sort of symmetrical squares often run into this problem. We actually already saw it uh, earlier in this game. Not in this game, but in, in the other mainline theory. Any ideas? So indeed, in this case, as the, the YouTube chat is saying, a4 is, is going to be a good move. Um, this is oftentimes, like really, really often, one of the most common things in chess. Uh, this is going to be a problem for, for knights on these four squares. Um, the earlier point I was referencing, if you remember, I think I can just jump back to it. Uh, if you remember in the bishop takes f5 line, way back here, uh, with g6 instead of knight e7, uh, in this line, remember at the end of the day, this h5 move gives, gives white a lot of problems. Because h4 harasses this knight, opens up the g file, and black can, can attack over here. So just as h5 is a good move against the knight against g3, um, 
a or a4 is going to be a good move here against the knight on, on b6. Just trying to get rid of this piece, trying to open up the queen side. Uh, of course, it is a pawn sacrifice, which we see now with knight takes a4. Uh, but this is not going to be great for, for black for a number of reasons. So number one, this bishop is not so solid now on a6 with an open file in front of it. Uh, this knight has been distracted from attacking our, our c4 pawn. And uh, Prague does actually just have uh, a very concrete, I concrete idea here for, uh, to follow up. So white to move here and, and sort of take the initiative. We just sacrificed a pawn. Got to keep the tempi rolling. Yeah. Yeah, just knight d5 here. And already, uh, black is, is probably not feeling the most comfortable. Uh, you might think that I can just double here, make some threats down the e file. But my bishop on h4 is actually useful. And I think simply here, we're going to take on c7. Um, and if you try, let's see. Now, I'm always a little bit nervous when I start just playing the chess moves. But I think something like this is going to be quite uh, quite nasty for, for black to deal with. All this pressure um, down this line. Maybe, actually, maybe I'm, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, let's see here. There must be something good. OK, I think rook e6. Yeah, it must, must be rook e6 here. Yeah, rook e6, rook e6, and then, and then rook a1 with the same ideas. Um, just we made these pieces a little bit weak on the a file. And now uh, black is, is going to pay the price. So rook e8, no good. Um, so what can, what can black do? Well, uh, bishop b7 is the move that Isipenko uh, comes up with. And now if I'm remembering correctly, uh, white is uh, pretty close to winning already. Uh, what Prague does is very, very simple. He just takes on e6 and takes control over the e file. So again, just playing with the common ideas we want to try to invade on the queen side. We want to try to invade on the e-file uh, once we've activated our pieces. Uh, Prague has already achieved knight, d, knight to d5, a very desirable thing to, to get in this structure. Uh, and so now the, the rest just comes down to, to calculating out uh, what the best way is to, to sort of punish black for the mistakes. So rookie one to start. Uh, queen to d7 is the move that uh, Essipenko comes up with. Um, already, you have to look out for ideas of this. Don't think it works right away, because our queen would be under fire. So rook f6, I think, is playable. Uh, but that's why Prague plays queen to g3, renewing the threat of knight to f6. Uh, Sipenko chooses rook to f7. And now knight f6 does just win, uh, win in exchange. Instead, if Sipenko had tried to capture this knight, uh, of course, now the danger is this move rook to e7. And you are in uh, all sorts of a bad way uh, in, in this case. Um, again, I don't have the exact line. I think just queen to g5 is simple enough. And if you try to go here, um, at the very least, I'm, I'm picking up uh, picking up like this. I'm picking up your piece like this. Not the other way, but, but this way should be good enough. Um, so there's just no way for you to really contest this rook. I'm, I'm invading and checkmating you, and uh, life isn't very fun. So uh, after queen to g3, that's why Essipenko chooses rook f7. But now this is just an extra exchange for Prague, and he's able to, uh, to win pretty convincingly here. Um, I remember on the live show, uh, there is a, a rather shocking move uh, in, in this position that Prague could have played to win the game. He chose to, to win through simple means, just played like queen to e e3. But I thought it'd be fun to show this one. White to move here and play potentially the, the most shocking move of the game uh, in order to win uh, very, very convincingly. So to give you a little bit of a hint, black just played bishop to c8 because bishop takes f5 was threatened. Like, let's say some stupid move. This is just going to be a checkmate in, in very short order. Um, rook e8, game over. So that was white's threat. This is why black played bishop to c8. So what can we do? What can we do?
I forgive you if you don't find this one. Uh, I would be very impressed. <laughs> OK, the YouTube chat does, in fact, have it. I'm just going to reveal very, very surprisingly, the move g4 uh, just directly, directly wins uh, in this position. Now, the reason for that is taking like this is not going to be good. We get to invade with queen h7. Taking with this guy is bad for the same reasons, um, although I might be putting my foot in my mouth a little bit. Uh, maybe we play this check first. Maybe we go queen e3 now. Um, I'm going to cheat. <laughs> uh, why is this so bad? OK, queen e3 is the reason why it's bad. When now rook f1 takes advantage of the open f file. Um, and bishop to b7 is actually an empty threat. We simply take on f5 and say you have one check, and that's all you have. Just a single check. I cover all the squares, and, and black is just busted. So g4 would have been a phenomenal, phenomenal finish to the game. Instead, queen e3, and, and Prague does go on to win without too many difficulties. Just brings the pieces in. And rooks are more powerful than knights, so white is going to win this game um, sooner rather than later. Just winning all the pawns on the king's side now. So why look at this game? Well, because it shows you one of the main plans uh, against uh, the a3 nimzo. Right? We know our idea. We know what we want. We want, we want f4, f5. We're keeping in mind bishop g5 ideas. And so one of the best ways for black to respond is to shut down f5 by going for this very concrete structure. Uh, and once we achieve this structure, we know our plans. We want to go bishop e3, uh, f2, h4. We want the rook on e1. We want this knight to come around to e3. And that's how we want to organize our forces. Now, of course, the specifics in the game are going to vary depending on what black does. But once you know this position and you've seen these repositioning ideas as played in this game by the young Indian prodigy, then I feel like you, you're comfortable, right? You know, you know where the pieces go. You know what you're supposed to do in the structure. And you, you know, the, the goal of your opening prep is not to beat your opponent in the opening. It's to, for me at least, it's to survive the opening and get a position that I feel more comfortable with. And so that's what we've achieved uh, just by knowing this, this little amount. Uh, so questions on, on this idea for black against the a3 nimzo? Because it really is, I, I think, the most common, the, the best, or one of the best ideas. So questions here. Um, so Rose, uh, remind me of black went wrong. Is it a bit later? Yeah, so, so far this was all very, very normal. And then this knight, knight to e7 move is a little bit off. And then as far as the specific blunders, um, uh, I'm honestly sort of forgetting the, the specific blunders. I think knight to c8 is sort of a very strange move already. Uh, I think here, though, black is still doing OK, if I can cheat. Yeah, black is a little bit worse. And the reason why black is a little bit worse is because this organization of the pieces doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, like I said, this knight wants to be on f6, wants to be aiming for the e4 square. This bishop kind of wants to come back to b7. Um, the knight on b6 is OK, but again, it's vulnerable to, to this idea. So because black has put the pieces on slightly weird squares, uh, black's going to be a little bit worse. But then, yeah, let's see where the actual blunder is. Um, knight d5, bishop b7, takes takes, rook e1. OK, it, it's here. Queen to d7 the second time is, is going to be the mistake, because these knight f6 threats turn out to be just too much for, for black to deal with. Um, so instead of that, according to the computer, it wants to play g5, which I think is a hard move to justify. But knight to c7 is also going to be OK, when after apparently bishop f6 is a good idea, um, we're actually going to get trades in a slightly unusual way. When again, OK, no, I messed that up. King f8, gf3. OK, I didn't mess it up. The computer just changed, it mind, changed its mind. Knight c3. In this case, we're going to get an exchange down endgame where black has two pawns for it. Um, and white is still going to be definitely pressing. And actually, the more I look at this position, the more I think white might win this game more often than he draws this game. Um, but apparently, this was just a better way to continue for, for black. Apparently, also, g5 is some nonsense that I, I don't want to spend any amount of time thinking about. <laughs> OK. 
So technically, uh, queen d7 is the big blunder that makes the position lost. But earlier, again, this move knight to e7 is the start of the sort of weird moves that uh, make black end up in a position that's not as comfortable uh, as it should have been. Uh, again, just to show the normal lines here, uh, rook to e1. This is how black is normally organizing the pieces. Um, knight goes to a5. This rook comes to e8. And this bishop comes back to b7. You see black very comfortably contests this file. This knight and bishop work together to come to e4. Uh, and, and the black pieces just make uh, a lot more sense. Uh, OK, that's a good question, though. So really quickly, I want to show you how we got there. Uh, we got uh, with knight to c3, a3. Uh, and we saw this move c5 to start with. Now we're going to play e3, not f3, because we want to save time and put this pawn on f4 right away. Bishop d3, knight e2, e4. And now black's idea, knight to e8. And if you go bishop a6, bishop g5 is a very, very strong move uh, when you have to deal with e5 threats. And you can't comfortably play this remaneuvering idea. So knight to e8. Now after we go f4, black strong idea is f5, going for this structure, uh, where we now know the ideas are to bring our pieces around, uh, bring this knight into e3, bring this bishop into h4, and play on the queen side and, and down the d file and e file. And that's, that's really all there is to uh, this particular line of the A3 Nimzo. Uh, now let's take a look at the other main plan, which is going to show up in this game, which is actually a blindfold game between Carlson and Leko. So as stated earlier in the lecture, uh, Black does not necessarily need to do this. And instead, as Brian pointed out, this is going to be the most common plan uh, against this structure. Now this does show up in the, that other line that we were looking at. You saw black was definitely still trying to pressure c4, but wasn't actually going to be able to win this, the c4 pawn. Whereas in this case, black uh, foregoes playing c5 right away. And instead of that, black is just going to do this right off, right off the bat. Just come after your c4 pawn, try to capture that guy, and try to, to take, the, take the money and run. So against this, somewhat confusingly, we are now going to play f3. Uh, and what's the point? The point is that in this variation, after f3, uh, b6 is not actually the most useful move. Black is going to be able to play something like knight to c6. And after something like e4, we're going to go d6. And black is going to be able to uh, get, get this structure a little bit more comfortably, where we're playing d6, we're getting e5 eventually, queen a5 here. We have immediate threats against the d4 pawn. So uh, against c5, I don't like f3 because the d4 pawn comes under fire when we play e4 right away. So that's why I like e3. You know, we, we defend d4 for a little bit, and we save time on f3 uh, in the long run. Now against b6, that does not put the immediate pressure on d4, which is going to make f3 a little bit of a better idea. b6 is kind of committing black to this other plan uh, of attacking on c4. Um, OK, no more cheating for anybody. <laughs> Knight to c6. E4 is our idea, bishop to a6. Uh, and now bishop to g5 is going to be the move that I'm, I'm recommending. So uh, in the f3 nimzo, uh, you would have already seen black castle and, and played knight e8, uh, much like the, the lines we were looking at earlier. But in the a3 nimzo, uh, black has not yet committed the king to castle and king's side. And that is one of the reasons why uh, black in this specific position is OK with allowing bishop to g5. So uh, black should play h6 to start with. And then here, um, g5 is one of the main moves. But I also want to take a quick look at knight to a5. So knight a5, why isn't white winning a piece? Why aren't we winning a piece here? Yeah, Brian? Yeah, S same idea. We, we go g5. Uh, and at first glance, this might look really kind of frightening, right? Like, you, you lose this knight on f6, I lose my bishop on h4. But lo look at your king side structure, right? <laughs> um, so this is why black doesn't allow these lines when he's already castled king side, because your structure gets fractured, you have all these weaknesses. But in this case, black is just going to be uh, winning out of the opening if white were to go for this. Because queen f6, black is going to take this pawn. We now do have to defend our pawn over here. 
And it turns out this G file is going to be really useful for black rather than you know, kind of a problem. Uh, this king can stay in the center for a while. Maybe, maybe, maybe it'll castle queenside, but the center is honestly safe enough for it for the moment. So this line, no good. Uh, but white can, of course, re retreat the bishop here. And that's going to transpose to the lines we're looking at in the game, where Leko just plays g5 first. So we're going to drop this bishop back to f2. And now after uh, queen to e7, uh, let's see if you guys can find Magnus's idea. So what was the point of it all? Why did we bring the bishop to g5 and, and provoke all these, these pawn pushes on, on the king's side? Why go through this whole charade? We could have just played bishop e3 in the first place. <laughs> we didn't have to take this long route to this diagonal. What do you think? We do want to play h4. It's exactly right. Um, so h4 already immediately threatens h takes g. And I don't think queenside castles is something black wants to do right away, although that is what Peter Leko wanted to do, it looks like. Um, but uh, knight h5 is the other idea, which I want to look at first. So I think I had that in, um, in this other line. So knight a5 first, e5, g5, uh, bishop f2. Uh, knight h5. Again, we still want to go h4 uh, against these lines as well. And now, for example, if black tries to take on c4, uh, I believe white is already going to be pretty significantly better. You, you can't take back with the pawn here, because after takes takes, we are already playing something like g4. And the pin down this file is going to be really, really important. So queen g5, for example, and now something like knight h3. And this uh, weak pawn on h6 is going to be a lot more relevant then white's pawn on, on g2. Uh, g4 is going to come out as well, and this knight is going to hop into some nice squares like f4, and white is just totally taking over uh, on the king's side. Um, so uh, that's why Leko goes for g5 in this instance, and after h4, his idea was, in fact, to queenside castle. However, here, white is able to immediately uh, seize the advantage. So how can white's... Uh, try and immediately go after this king on c8. Castling queenside definitely came with some pretty major risks. Comes with some major risks here. Yeah, so queen a4 uh, is sort of superficially tempting, but I do think that knight a5 is uh, a natural move for, for black that solves, uh, solves the immediate problem here. Black wants to play knight a5 anyways. Again, we're still actually going after this pawn on c4, and knight a5 does prevent you know, the, the threat to the bishop. So what do you do when you have a big center and your opponent has done nothing to, to challenge it in the middle of the board? Mobilize it. Yeah, in this case, white can very effectively uh, mobilize it and uh, prod some weaknesses into this, into this structure on, on the queen side for black. I'm going to be able to poke some holes here. And wow, the, the chats. It's in shambles tonight. People getting banned left and right. So 
So of course, there's three moves that you're looking at, right? You're looking at this one, this one, and this one. So I want to start with e5, because I think it actually makes the, the least amount of sense here. Um, e5, what does e5 do? Well, it locks up these two pawns. It forces our opponent to play knight h5, which is honestly a move that they want to play. And it makes our, our job of playing d5 uh, a little bit harder, right? So e5, not going to be the way, way to go here. But c5 and d5 are both kind of tempting in, in their own ways. Uh, not quite. So I, we can functionally play d5. Um, you're not going to get away with taking this. Um, this is intention, so you have to take your first. Um, and then I do think I am going to take with my king, but you're, you're not winning a pawn or anything. So d5 is playable, but do you want to play it? Yeah, so uh, c5 is, is what we want to do. Uh, it, it's definitely desirable to play c5. Um, now, the thing is, d5 first is going to be a little bit stronger uh, in, in this instance. And the reason for that is not because we are super interested in having a d5 pawn, but it's going to allow us to play a really annoying move, d6, uh, in, in the following variations. So why is d6 so desirable? Well, if we can get rid of this c7 pawn um, for something like c takes d, then the black king is going to start to be in, in some serious trouble. Whereas if we just play c5 now, let's say takes takes, um, and I don't know, maybe knight a5. Uh, yeah, sure, we can fix our doubled pawns uh, by capturing here. But I think the black king is, is going to live to tell the tale. Uh, we didn't exactly rip open the position on, on the queen side. Uh, king b7 is going to follow, and the rooks might even come back to the a file. They might, they're going to come wherever they're needed over here on the queen side. Um, c6 is not going to quite be working, um, and I think d takes c would be an improvement in the structure for black. Um, so I got to stop doing that, pressing the up arrow. <laughs> okay, so that is why d5 is Magnus's choice in this instance. Now, that line that I showed isn't going to be ideal for black because we do fix the white pawns here, and um, I don't know if we want to play d6 immediately. But I think d6 is, is going to be a strong idea, as is something like bishop to d4. Um, I'm even looking at like c4, c5 again, uh, when after knight c4, I might be, might be uh, putting some pressure, putting some pressure uh, down the c5. So rather than that, black chose to leave the pawns doubled with knight to a5. But now this is going to allow c5 as a nice little follow-up. Uh, so as you were saying, it looks like there might be some tactics here involving taking on d5, trying to use this e-file. But first, black has to deal with the, the bishops being in tension. And then Magnus's idea is revealed after this move, bishop takes f1. So we have a really, uh, really nasty move here for, for black, which I might have hinted at already. Mm -hmm. What do you think? D6. D6, of course, with tempo on the queen. Uh, and now you know, we can try to move away, but we're going to get uh, captured on c7 with tempo. So takes. And then this is where Magnus goes wrong in the game. He foolishly captures his pawn back to leave himself with a pawn on d6. And white's doing fine here. White's doing well, uh, doing OK, I think, if I remember correctly. But it turns out. The peace sacrifice, pawn takes b6, was actually just completely crushing in this game. You can bring the bishop back. I'm going to come here, threatening to queen. Try something like this. I come queen a4, rook b1, and all your pieces are, are in trouble. And the black king has absolutely no shelter left. So that would have been a nice end of the game. Uh, instead, the game continued with takes on d6, and they played a ton of moves. Magnus ended up pretty significantly worse, but then managed to save the game at the end of the day. Uh, played this peace sacrifice, got the peace back, um, tried to develop his king. I think he was still pretty losing. And then eventually, uh, they, they repeated moves, and to the, the, game, the game was drawn. Uh, that latter half of the game, not so important to us. You get the idea. White was trying to attack the king on, on the queen's side. So 
uh, the reason why I wanted to show this game is because against the second big idea uh, in the opening, bishop a6, knight a5, we also know what we want to do. We want to go bishop g5, bishop h4, bishop back to f2, and try to pressure the, um, the uh, king side for black. Now, if you're curious, I think the best way to play here with black is to go f or knight h5, and after uh, h4, um, not queen f6, I'm actually going to switch back to the other move order because I remember it better. Um, I do like uh, knight a5 here rather than g5 for black when we do go down the same uh, force and variation. But after h4 here, rather than bishop takes c4, this move f5 I do think is, is going to be good enough for black to try and equalize. For example, takes, queen takes, knight h3, queen g6. And black is going to have some activity over here. Uh, something like g4, for example, is going to be very concrete. Um, sorry, not, not takes, but bishop d3. Queen back, takes, knight f4. And you get into some, some pretty tactical complications here, where at the end of the day, it's going to be more or less level. Queen to e2, finally defending her pawn. Castles, bishop e3, g3, bishop back to f2. Okay, apparently, this, this game ended in a, in a draw with this. But if I consult the big computer, let's see. I'm sure there's some way to deviate here. Um, yeah, maybe instead of g4, yeah, we can just continue with, with bishop h4. Just just play, basically, just, just play chess here. We can play g3. We can do a number of things to just keep the game going. Uh, so that's where, where black, I think, went wrong here. I don't like this uh, queen e7 idea in general from, from Leko. Again, castling queenside, uh, while it, it might technically be okay, um, I do think white is, is going to have a, a much better game with these ideas of expanding in the center, going after the black king. Um, and, and going for the attack. So those are the two big ideas that I looked at prior to the game, just so you have some kind of concept of how much time I spent on this. Um, I had never really tried to study the A3 Nimza before from the white side, and in a couple of hours, I felt like I was able to confidently play this against a player uh, who's a little bit higher rated than me, actually. So if you're looking to play the A3 Nimza yourself as a surprise weapon like, like I was, if you spend just a couple hours on it and you don't play it like every game, then I do think you're going to have pretty decent results. So what did all of this prep work culminate into? Well, of course, it culminated into my game against Julian Proleko in the Master Lab. And just to show you how this went for all of my opening work I spent a couple hours on, we got the A3 Nimzo. I did it, and he was shocked and surprised. Um, takes, takes. He does play c5. So do we remember the move after c5? So c5 puts pressure on the d4 pawn. So what do you want to do? E3, e3 not f3. Yeah. Um, he played knight to c6. So far, so good. Bishop to d3. Again, we want to go e4, knight e2, these kinds of moves. And then he played queen to c7. So of course, I had not checked this move. I knew this move was probably wrong. Uh, but no need to panic because I know that the common ideas for white here. You want to go knight e2. He goes b6. I go e4. And then he sort of started surprising me. He chose d6 here. So I go f4. Again, very, very common ideas. And now after knight to a5, uh, I immediately blunder. So white is doing pretty well here. I think it's around plus one uh, if you can find uh, a good continuation. So this was my moment to prove that I had defeated Julian in the opening preparation battle, seize the advantage, and, and go on to win in glory, which of course I didn't do in the game, because chess games never go quite as you expect. This was for Master Lab, right? Yes, in the Master Lab. So of course, what has Julian done uh, that's different than the norm? Well, in the c5, knight c6 lines, if you remember, black was often castling, playing knight e8, and meeting f5 ideas with f5 himself. So in this instance, Julian has refrained from castling, perhaps wasted a little bit of time playing queen c7 and d6 unprovoked. And because of those two things, uh, white's going to be able to, to take the advantage um, by doing what?
Uh, yeah, so f5 is, of course, going to be an idea here. But it turns out that the way that Julian has played has sort of targeted, targeted this f5 break immediately. right? He's set up on these dark squares. We do go f5. I think e5 is what Julian was intending when um, I wasn't entirely certain if I was going to be, be doing well here or not. Uh, I have to deal with these threats. And again, black has managed to keep this diagonal closed. Yes, the, the dark squared bishop has opened up, but I, I wasn't sure if it was the best that I could do. Turns out that there's, there's something else that you can do. On the chat is now deciding my opinions on all number of things that I've never talked about. <laughs> Mr. E, I'm glad I responded to your point, but I don't think I saw your point. E5? Yes, so e5 here is going to be uh, really brutal. For, for black to deal with. If you try knight to d7, for example, um, immediately now f5 is going to be good. We've prevented black from keeping things locked down. And I'm not even going to try to play these uh, from my own brain here. Yeah, d takes e5, f e6, f e6, castles, for example. And with this king locked in the center, it, it's going to be a big fight. I've given up a lot uh, as far as my central pawns go. But white is going to be on the better side of things with this black king sort of really stuck in the center. Um, which, yeah, I think actually, yeah, the computer prefers castling first is, is uh, the best way to do it. So we leave the pawn's intention for a little while longer, uh, and then we're able to go f5. And if black tries f5 himself, we have a really nice idea here of d5 when black just hasn't coordinated well enough, wasted too much time on the queen's side to, to stop our ideas uh, in, in this direct, direct manner. So e5 would have been great. Instead, I play this awful move, d5. Um, trying to remember some of these lines I had looked at where, let's say, castles here, if black had tried e5. Now d5 is going to be strong because I can play f4, rip open the f file, and win. Um, instead, when I play d5 in this position, turns out to be very wrong because e takes d5, c takes d5 is good. And I have, uh, I have a lot of trouble now keeping my center together. If you're curious how this game went, I'll show you a few more moves. Black continues on the queen side. Um, goes for a very concrete line that wins the pawn. Turns out he would have been a lot better off just playing bishop g4 and kind of just playing the position after h3 takes takes and just playing for, for the weaknesses in my center. Instead, he chose this concrete line uh, where after now bishop g4, my queen has no squares, uh, so I have to go to e1, and this allows knight takes d5. Uh, it turns out, though, this is going to give me a lot of counterplay. Uh, I found the best move, h3, and then Julian, unfortunately, um, blundered in this position, which is a very com complex position, but uh, lucky me, uh, my opponent blundered. Sometimes it happens. He played this move, queen e3, uh, hoping that I would capture and capture, uh, I believe. No, not hoping for that. Um, so his idea is, if I do capture, don't have time to capture here because my own bishop is hanging. And if I try to take on g4, uh, then queen g3. And I do manage to go up a piece here, but it's not a very happy piece that I'm up because I am going to be getting checkmated in this position. So that was his big idea, but he missed that I can just defend my knight. And then he has two pieces hanging, and I have no pieces hanging. So this is going to turn out well for, for me. Um, takes, takes, knight d3, takes, takes on f1, takes on f1, and I have two pieces for the rook, and should go on to win easily. Whether or not that actually happened is a different story, but at the end of the day, did end up winning this game. So there you go. That's the work that I did to uh, prepare this surprise a3 weapon, uh, and it's really not a lot. Uh, if you only have to spend an hour or two preparing an entire opening line against the F, uh, against the, the Ninzo Indian defense, then that's that's very good uh, return on investment for, for your time, right? The, the Ninzo Indian is a huge, massive, massive branch of chess against d4. And in just a couple short hours, I think you two can feel confident in, in the a3 Ninzo. There's really these two big lines to learn. And then you, know, you can do as much work as you want. Obviously, there's always going to be sidelines. But I felt confident playing it, just knowing these two big ideas and what to do against them. So hopefully you found this informative. Hopefully you also feel a little bit more familiar with the, the two big ideas against uh, the A3 Nimzo Indian. 
And again, if black knows all the stuff, black is going to be fine, but that's just going to be chess uh, no matter what opening you pick. So A3 Nimzo, one of my new favorite surprise weapons. And now I can never surprise anyone again, because as soon as they Google my name and A3 Nimzo, then, then they'll see that I know, know a little bit about this as well. Uh, it's the price you pay for, for teaching chess, I guess. Um, so any final questions for me before I, I call it quits here? Uh, we do have uh, Women Grandmaster Katarina Nemkova coming in right after me uh, with some more fun chess for you guys. But any final questions? All right, well, thank you all so much for joining. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you guys next time.